we don't have a system of beliefs and skills in place to be able to turn out this kind of painting anymore. I don't think it's horrifying to admit that. We're not connected enough to it to be able to do it ourselves, but we are connected enough to it to be moved by it. Tonight's artist is Titian. That's a painting by him there. Titian is a late Renaissance painter. The Renaissance is already set up by his time. The centres are Florence and Rome. The style is tight, clear and flat. But in the early part of the 16th century, in Venice, where Titian lives, a new style starts up, kind of freeing up the Renaissance. The style of Venetian painting, which is loose and free and has Titian as its main figure. So art historically, Titian is the guy who most of the artists whose paintings are in this room, Rubens, Velázquez, Rembrandt among them, are all looking at over their shoulder while they're working in their studios. They see the rich, melting touch of Venetian painting. It's suave effect. Perseus rescues Andromeda from a sea monster. Because we're only human, we're interested in her flesh. And that's the stuff that Titian can really get across. But the non-flesh imagery is connected to the flesh imagery. It's all united in that broken, patchy, greeny-brown texture that makes up the whole image. Andromeda's parents have to sacrifice her to save the city where they live. But the painting hardly bothers with all that. Its real meaning is something else. Its impact comes from the touch of the brush and the play of the colour. If it were painted in a different way, it wouldn't have that feeling. So it's not the mythological subject that makes it what it is. It's the hazy, swirly, mergy colour that comes from Titian's painterly treatment. That treatment doesn't come from nowhere. The mottled, dusky surface, the sheen on the flesh and on the clothes, the constant feel of things changing and reforming. The city of Venice itself is a kind of nurturing ground for all that. The defining features of Venetian painting are a bit like those of Venice itself, especially different types of light. Reflected light in the lagoons and canals, which is strong and bright, contrasted with soft, dispersed light. What you're seeing in the architecture and the stuff that surrounds it, the water and the sky, is the boundaries between the man-made and the organic always blurring, nature always changing, and the man-made being deliberately designed to respond to those changes. And the stuff of this exchange between all those elements is light and colour. With its streaming, flowing facades, breaking up of bright surfaces with patterned openings, reflections everywhere, Venice was all about glittering, shimmering decoration. When Titian arrived here as a teenager, this rich look of the city that still survives today was even more exaggerated. Where we see charmingly distressed stone, a lot of the canal-faced buildings would have been covered with brightly coloured pictures done directly on the wall. Tiziano Vercellio, known to English-speaking audiences as Titian, was born in the town of Cadore, a little bit outside of Venice, sometime between the mid or late 1480s and 1490. No one knows exactly when, but we do know that by the early 1500s, when he was a teenager, he was in Venice, working as the pupil and assistant of Giovanni Bellini, a much older artist, and that by 1507, he was part of the Venice art world. He left Bellini's studio, and was knocking about with the painter Giorgione, who was about 10 years older than Titian. Titian had absorbed Bellini's style and was now copying Giorgione's style and sometimes collaborating with him on paintings. Oil painting wasn't invented in Venice, but Venice was where the medium was pushed the most. Giorgione and Titian were in the first generation of artists to train using oil. They both did frescoes at first, water-based paintings done directly into plaster on the wall, but they soon abandoned that for oil on canvas. That building that you can just see looming up now on the other side of the Rialto Bridge 
is where some frescoes used to be by Titian and Giorgione, the Fondaco dei Tedeschi. Now it's a post office, but in the 16th century, it was the headquarters of a load of German merchants. Giorgione's frescoes were visible on the canal side, this side, all along the building there. And Titian's were visible on the other side, the street side. Now all the frescoes are long gone, destroyed by the weather. The style of Titian's frescoes was a mixture of Giorgione and Bellini, his first teachers. This is Bellini, soft, gentle. The painting is the tenderest subject you can imagine, the Madonna and child. And yet, there's no false sentimentalism or sugariness whatsoever. The Madonna is a collection of blue triangles. The sky is a variation on that blue. The child connects with the colour of the background landscape. That landscape has a dreaminess that's like a separate mood on its own, and that mood is what Bellini's pupil, Giorgione, goes in for. This is Giorgione's style. This is his painting, The Tempest, from about 1510. There is no story, only a mood. The people are neither biblical nor mythological. They're not anybody. They don't stand for anything. You think she's the Virgin Mary, but actually the Virgin Mary would never be nude. In Giorgione's paintings, as with Titian's, X-rays show there's a lot of changes. The soldier, for example, started out as a nude woman. Previously, in Renaissance art, you worked everything out in advance before you started painting. In this new type of art, ideas and themes change all the time the painting has been put together. The scene gradually shuffles into place on the canvas. This is the earliest known painting that is definitely by Titian and that has survived in a good state. It's from 1510 the same time as Giorgione's The Tempest. It's the Holy Family and a Shepherd in London's National Gallery. By now, Titian is advancing his oil painting technique as he's seen Giorgione doing it. It's based on improvising. He moves paint around until he comes up with shapes that feel right. So this white stuff of the Virgin Mary's clothes and Jesus's clothes appears to find something like a perfect balance in the white clothes of that shepherd over there. It's not something that Titian could have calculated. And in fact, it's a complete fiction anyway, because a shepherd would never have white clothes. He's a farm labourer. So it's something that the painting needs and that Titian has found in the paint. The painting is full of anatomical wrongness. The head of that guy is much too big. But the mood of the painting, its sweetness and loveliness, seems absolutely right. And it's to do with this balance of shapes here and here. And that's something that Titian has arrived at by trial and error. So this is Titian learning to be Titian. Fifty years later, this is Titian being Titian to the max. The painting is Eke Homo, which means behold the man. Jesus is about to die, and he's being shown to the people by Pontius Pilate. The story is entirely dramatized through the physical stuff of the paint. There's a repulsive fatness about the white of the ermine that comments on the emotion of that face, the worldly man, Pilate. The white there, at the edge of Christ's coat, is misty and intangible. It's a comment on the purity of the spiritual man, Jesus. Christ's humility opposed to Pilate's corrupt glossiness. This is a powerful rendering of a story, with painterly handling taking the story onto a whole new level. The meaning is in the paint. It's in the white, the shimmery, broken up, patchy look of it throughout the painting. Now let's look at someone else doing religion, the Roman Renaissance instead of Venetian. These are Michelangelo's decorations for the Sistine Chapel. This is all religious storytelling too, but it's very different to Titian. The art of Michelangelo is all in the contours of the figures, in the modelling of the muscles within the contours, and in the way everything seems to inhabit this space so rightly and nicely, without the space ever appearing to be crowded. But none of that is really painterly. The colours are separated from each other by line. 
There's a very high decorative charm to the way colour is balanced out, but the essential element is still drawing, and not, as with Titian, who is Michelangelo's opposite, the action of the brush. Michelangelo just thought that Titian didn't concentrate enough on drawing, that Titian was a good colourist and a good dramatiser of a scene, but basically, it'd be a lot better if he just put more effort into drawing. The difference is that with Michelangelo, you feel figures can be peeled off and put somewhere else. With Titian, the feeling is that figures and objects, a body, a tear on a cheek, some silk sheets, the glint of a knife, the fold of a curtain, are conjured up out of a lot of loose paint. They are the paint. Titian is a paint engineer. He gets paint to have the feel of a lot of different surfaces in the world. But these surfaces, which he fabricates, are always set off by one in particular, which he renders with an incredible range of handling, and that's the surface of flesh. So here we are at the heart of what it is that Titian does. If flesh is something Titian paints very well, it's because he sees it as one of the trappings of luxury. The world Titian paints, the Venetian world of power and money, is all about who's got more and who's got less flesh he paints is very opulent it goes with oil's richness oil is the way to get the glitter and the luster and the luxury stuff his powerful clients want to surround themselves with here is titian his self-portrait from 1510 when he was still in his 20s thinking hey powerful guys i've got what you want Welcome back. Renaissance people saw themselves in Titian's art, their world. It captured existence, but also amplified it. You can see this mixture of the believable and the real, with the otherworldly, always in Titian, but also in the art of the Venetian painters who followed his style, and whose work is still all over Venice. While Titian's output is mostly now all broken up and seen outside of its original context. This is Venetian painting en masse. It's paintings by Veronese and Tintoretto, who are both about 25 years younger than Titian. They carry on Titian's influence. They're like the Titianettes. The scenes here are religious, mythological, and portraits. The style is all about visual subtlety, along with sudden contrast. Drama, along with richness. It's the kind of thing that was in the churches and government buildings of Venice, as well as the private homes of Venetians who had made money from trading, because Venice was really ruled by merchants. This is what it looks like here in a museum. And this is how it looked in the kind of places it was originally done for. These are paintings by a lot of different artists on the ceiling of the Doge's Palace in Venice. That one up there by Veronese shows the goddess Juno showering gold coins on Venice. All around the palace it's a visual orgy. Everywhere you see marble, light and luxury. Luxury in the Doge's palace is about celebrating Venice's prestige to the citizens of Venice, to rival Italian cities, especially Rome, and to foreign powers. It's all about non-stop visual confidence. Luxury is kind of parceled out in different ways. It has different modes. Let's look at Venetian-style luxury in the service of poverty. These are Tintoretto's decorations for the Scuola di San Rocco in Venice. Remember, Tintoretto is one of Titian's Venetian influencees. Every inch of the walls and the ceiling is lined with paintings showing scenes from the Bible. This is a charitable hospice where the poor and the sick were tended by a brotherhood of Christian carers. Venice was always being afflicted by the plague and plague victims came here to die. So the Venetian style can be adapted to a setting where death and suffering is the thing. But actually it's very striking everywhere here how outrageous show-off confidence is also the thing. 
You see how in Tintoretto's Crucifixion, the scene is made vivid by the organization of color and by the nature of the color, atmospheric, full of rich darkness. Everything is geared to that white ellipse, the crucifixion rising up in the middle, the groups of swaggering guys in the luxury outfits either side, the ones in armor there and in turbans there. Color in Venetian painting isn't just bright color, which is what people usually think color in art means. It's color working, so it has feeling, it has emotion, like that transition from blue-gray to hazy pink to gray-white in the sky. You think, wow, so this is art. This is what it can do. All this is what Titian presides over. These artists and these settings for the art are all part of a kind of culture of Titian. The culture wasn't mapped out in the way we see it now. In Titian's time, no one had ever heard of museums. His audience bought his paintings to put in their own places of special power, their palaces and chapels and stuff. We're not the same as them. They were educated aristocrats. There were very few of them. There are millions of us. We're a mixture of different levels of education, expertise, familiarity with the insides of museums. We don't have the same shared symbolic world that Renaissance people had. Today's tourist experience of art is a lot of random loveliness. One minute you're in art galleries and chapels in Florence, then back on the canal in Venice, where I'm heading now. I think it's surprising how expertise on the old masters also seems a bit random. A few facts here and there mixed with imagination. Let's imagine Titian at work. He's just been summoned to a duke's palace somewhere in Italy to do a painting. But he's doing it in Venice instead because of the models here who all come from brothels. The duke's agent is explaining to the duke that there's a shortage of brothels in the duke's city. Other agents are around to the studio to arrange other commissions. Can Titian paint a portrait of the Doge in Venice or the Pope in Rome? Or the Emperor of Spain. Humanists are lounging and posing about the studio. Humanists are poets and intellectuals and scholars who know about symbolism in painting. Courtiers from other cities are hanging on Titian's every word. Myths are arising of his greatness. The Emperor of Spain bends over to pick up a brush that Titian has just accidentally dropped. Oh no, Titian, allow me. This comes from Giorgio Vasari, the first art historian who's round at the studio writing Titian's biography. Titian's assistants are grinding up his paints because they haven't invented tubes yet. There's just piles of pigments on tables with pestles and mortars and jars of linseed oil. Titian's friend, Pietro Aretino, the author of sonnets which anyone who's anyone reads, is now in the studio composing verses to Titian's painterly genius. The light that falls on the edge of the Venetian palazzo is like a brushstroke in one of the paintings of Tiziano. This would be the kind of thing that went on in Titian's studio, more or less, if not all on the same day. An old building, now stonemasons in the Vidi Grande, here at the north end of Venice, is likely to be the exact location where Titian's studio actually was. Let's have a look now at what he might have been working on. This is a scene of the god Bacchus about to make love to the mortal Ariadne. It's got something to tell us about how an old master painting works for a modern audience. It's one of a group of paintings commissioned by the Duke of Ferrara to go in a smallish room in the palace where the Duke can retire at the end of the day of doing ducal things and show off his paintings to his friends. He wants these paintings to imitate a description of ancient paintings that exists in a well-known bit of old writing. Titian has to have a subject for these paintings to be about. So he's given a few lines of ancient poetry, translated from Latin into modern Italian, so he can understand them. And one of those poems describes the myth of Bacchus and Ariadne. Ariadne is deserted on the shores of Naxos by her lover, Theseus. She's in despair. She's spotted by the god Bacchus, who makes love to her and turns her into a constellation of stars. Now, Titian has to come up with a look for this because no one knows what an ancient painting looks like. None survive. Only ancient sculptures survive. And in fact, Titian has based the poses of most of these figures on casts of ancient sculptures. 
All that it says in that old writing is that those ancient paintings were very lifelike. And Titian has to get that through composition, colour and handling. And that's what he does. He's got all the warm, browny, orange colour in this part of the painting and all the cool blue colour in that part of the painting. And then there's invasions of one colour into the other colour area, so it all seems to lock together. So you've got this brilliant blue skirt surrounded by warm orange and brown, and these lovely blue flowers surrounded by warm brown there, and then the warm brown colouring of Bacchus with the cool blue around him. Then there's this rush of Bacchus's followers, the snake wrestlers, the maenads and the little satyrs. They're all tearing apart wild animals, because that's what you do in a bacchanalian frenzy. And then there's this cut through the rush of the figure of Bacchus. That's the instant of Bacchus's love for Ariadne. And that's what the painting's about. Now all this is Titian's own visual invention. It's all coming out of his head. He's made it up from nothing. It's based on a few lines of old poems and descriptions of old paintings. But he's come up with something totally visually new. And that's what is there for us. The story is what the painting's about. But the goodness of the painting doesn't depend at all on you knowing the story. With some of Titian's paintings, hardly anything is known about them anyway. Like this girl. What's her story? Find out in a minute. Hello. The Titian painting we're going to hear about now is a sex pot. The other news is she's got a sister. The first one lives here in Florence, and the second one a bit further away, in Paris. The Venus of Urbino is a Titian that we have very little hard information on, but it's become one of the main icons of the Western tradition of the nude in painting. As a bit of high culture, it couldn't be more respectable. Venus is always the goddess of love, but Venus wasn't Titian's title for this painting. We don't know what he called it. There was a convention in Venice of paintings of anonymous beauties, which later acquired titles from mythology, like Venus. But this is different because of the non-mythological surroundings. A room in a palace, servants in the background. The model was very likely a prostitute. According to records, there were about 12,000 in Venice when this was painted. Where Titian himself is in all this backstory is a tricky one. We know he employed prostitutes as models, but we don't know anything at all about his personal sex life. At this moment, the painting's agreed symbolism is in the process of changing. It's going from one meaning to another. Painting's meanings change all the time. You can have an eye for what they look like. In this case, the jewel-like loveliness that Titian gets with this intense green and red and white, and the greys here all offsetting that the extreme darkness of that green and the soft evening light behind it and the incredibly subtle realisticness of her form against the white sheet and you can enjoy what seems to be a bit of Freudian symbolism the line of the curtain leading directly to the part of her body that maybe the whole painting is about but you'll always only be a prisoner of whatever is in the air at the time intellectual fashions ideas in art history you'll never have all the answers to what it is you're really looking at. It's from art history that we get meanings in art, but art history isn't the Bible or even the Highway Code. You've got to question it, not unquestioningly believe in it all the time. Until recently, art history assumed that Titian's Venus was light porn. A way of having female nudity in art by imbuing it with a bit of ancient mythological symbolism. Venus, the goddess of love. Cue a bit of false swooning. When you're looking at art history, you've got to remember you're looking at things that are established, but only in ways that might easily change. Art history began in the 18th century. The main ideas were set up categories, styles, movements and isms, as opposed to just histories of individual great artists' lives. From these ideas followed assumptions and attitudes, and these changed as the conditions that art was made in changed, as society changed. The way the art of the past was seen changed too. 
In this painting, Manet's Olympia from 1865, which is a 300 years later sincere homage to Titian's Venus and a bit of a punky sneer against it, respectability is taken away and the shock of sex is put back. She is a prostitute in a brothel. That's the setup. The little cat graphically represents what her hand conceals. Both the vigorous roughness of the paint handling, which refers back directly to the style of Venetian painting, and the brazenness of the brothel setting are Manet wanting to get painting back into gear, to rev up the great tradition again, to make it strong instead of twee, which it had become in the hands of the straits of Manet's time. Manet makes explicit what academic artists of the 19th century who painted nudes based on the tradition started by Titian, but slickly done instead of broadly done, were being coy about. Their mythological nudes were sweet and tepid. This is Alexandra Cabanel's Venus Rising from the Waves, from the same time that Manet painted Olympia. This was the official taste then, kind of hideous as art, but just the ticket for the audience of the time as an exciting idea polished nudity right there to stare at and nothing remotely challenging going on. With Olympia, all this is upside down. The painting is exciting because the paint is aggressive. The situation is transparent. Everything's self-conscious. In the 20th century, Titian's Venus was seen in the light of Olympia as a pre-modern art sex bomb waiting to go off. Olympia was a shocker when it was first shown in Paris, but hardly any of the critics who complained about it noticed that it referred to Titian. Those who did acknowledged the sophistication of the reference, but thought that Manet was just playing a game with it, using sophistication to be deliberately crude. Olympia was first shown in a huge public exhibition. A furious critical row erupted. There was a scandal in the papers. The scandal of the subject was the main thing. She was obviously a prostitute, with a scandal of style following that. She looks like an ape. He can't paint. She's got no bones. She's a corpse. So Manet provides a modern context, modern life, for an ancient tradition in art started by Titian, the sensual handling of materials. But it's also the beginning of a new tradition of shocks in art. This is the tradition of the avant-garde, where artists want to shake everything up, and the scandal is right for that. The legacy of Manet's Olympia is Tracy Emin's unmade bed, they're both very frank about sexuality. Of course, that's to leave out the incredible painterly thing that Manet does, but then that's what the official avant-garde art of nowadays does. It leaves out that painterly thing. Remember, we're looking at the way in which the meaning of the Venus of Urbino is not actually the meaning, but a fluctuating lot of different meanings. As more is learned about Renaissance society, it turns out that at the time it was painted, Titian's Venus probably did have a respectable, even moralistic meaning. This is where the painting went when it was sold, the palace in Urbino. The Duke of Urbino bought the painting in 1538 when he was 24 years old. Recently, the idea has come up in art history studies that the Venus is a painting celebrating marriage and not describing what it might be like to be a rich client visiting a high-class Venetian prostitute. The Duke of Urbino had already been married for four years. His wife was still not quite 14, which would have made her 10 at the time they were married. This is bad for modern times and makes us cross. But in the 16th century, betrothal at 10 wasn't unusual. There was a whole system of customs and propriety that went with it. Although, yes, in the end, it was a misogynist time. But the Venus of Urbino still might not be a misogynist or even demeaning to women painting. It might only be art history since the 18th century that gives it that cast. Let's look at her again. She isn't necessarily reduced to a mere object. In fact, she confidently returns our look with her look. So in this picture, her sexuality isn't necessarily the main thing about her. Those are roses in her hand and Roses stand for love, and in Renaissance symbolism, a myrtle plant is love too, because it's always blooming. That's right for sex, but what about the dog? Titian painted portraits of the Duke's parents. In the one of the Duke's mother, the same dog appears. As sex, that would be weird. 
Maybe it's Titian's pet. Maybe it just kept walking into his paintings. But that's unlikely in a world of constant alertness to the symbolic potential of everything, which is what the Renaissance world was. Nothing in painting just happened. It always meant something. Dogs meant faithfulness, as they do now. And the one in this painting isn't barking, so whoever she's looking at isn't a stranger. Why shouldn't it be her husband? In fact, she's probably nothing so literal as either a real prostitute or a real wife, but a principle, an ideal. Those wooden chests in the background would be associated, for a Renaissance period viewer, with marriage. It was a custom in upper-class life to give pairs of chests like these as a wedding gift. They sometimes had scenes of Venus and love carved inside. The logic of this painting probably follows that. It's a painting on canvas version of a scene within a marriage chest, demonstrating the place of sexual love within marriage. Actually, this interpretation of the Venus of Urbino goes back to scholarship in Manet's time. It was because of Olympia that research was done that dug up new information. It was only recently that the results began to be taken seriously. In our time, the information wasn't considered sexy enough before. But what makes Titian always exciting, like the myrtle plant always blooming, isn't facts about mythology or prostitutes, which are all just for planet scholarship anyway, but what Titian does with paint. Flesh in Titian isn't seductive because flesh is always that, but because he paints it like that. Come back and be seduced again in a minute. Welcome back. This is Titian's portrait of the Emperor of Spain. And right next to it is Titian's painting of Christ being tortured before being crucified. One painting is about power and prestige, and the other is about life and death. As a Renaissance period Catholic, Titian would have believed there was a duality of light and dark, that existence is composed of opposites. But as an artist, he mixed things up. Imagine two information patterns overlaid, each telling you something opposite. One is playfulness, invention, love, the love of texture, paint, the weave of the canvas. Two is torment, darkness and death, a profound questioning of everything positive. This is what a late Titian is like. All his confidence and ease and his daring bravery, putting paint on however he wants, all that is in the service of an image of profound doubt and anxiety. Personally, I think as his audience, we tend to mix modes too. Belief, because these paintings are fantastic, but also scepticism, because we're modern people. We want to find things out for ourselves. We assume artists were more sincere in the old days. Why not think they did it for the money? Since, after all, they did. You could be great and kind of straight. The two weren't opposites in the way that today we assume they should be. Titian pushed his career by taking the right commissions, getting the right introductions. By the time he painted the Venus of Urbino, for example, when he was in his late forties, he was the first artist to paint not just for a particular city, but for cities everywhere in the world. He was the first modern style international artist. The reason Titian was known to the Urbino court was that he had painted the portraits of the Urbino family. Other dukes whose portraits he'd done introduced him to them. In fact, the main reason for Titian's rise to international fame was his portraits. Through a kind of portrait chain, the Duke of Ferrara introduced him to the Duke of Mantua, who introduced him to the Emperor of Spain. When Titian first made contact with the Emperor, Spain ruled much of Europe, including parts of Italy. The Pope's power in Rome was completely secondary to the Emperor's power. So becoming the personal friend of the Emperor, as Titian quickly did, was very shrewd of Titian. Portraits were a currency for him. They brought him power. But there was also something radical and new that he brought to them. Before Titian, portraits were half this size, rigid, in profile, like an image on a coin. With Titian, the hands were in, there was a three-quarters view, and a lot of suggested movement. The lifelikeness, atmosphere and feeling 
uh, from the restlessness of the paint as much as the psychological depth of the expression on the face. It's hard to appreciate how new all this was when Titian did it, because these qualities have been current in portrait painting right up until modern art. So we assume they were always there. But it was Titian, and this is his self-portrait, who invented them. This natural alliance in Titian's psychology between being a bit of an operator and having an eye for the main chance, and at the same time being one of the most inventive, creative imaginations in all of art, went back years and years. Early on in his career, in 1518, Titian painted this altarpiece, The Assumption, in the church of Santa Maria Gloriosa dei Ferrari, or the Ferrari, as it's known, for a very low fee, not because he was so pious or Christian, but because he saw it as a good opportunity to advertise his skills. Titian was a bourgeois businessman, and he never forgot about the business side of what he did. When he was knighted 15 years later by the Emperor of Spain for painting the Emperor's portrait, and Titian and both his sons received pensions for life from the Emperor, the significance for Titian was not that he'd achieved nobility, but that he'd become incredibly successful. That's what being an artist then involved, being creatively independent, but still believing in the values of the church and kings, not being alienated from them, but rolling along with them. The trendy idea of art today is a mixture of amusing, unhinged, anything-goes stuff and a moralising idea of the artist's exalted role as outsider. Unconsciously, we're still a bit driven by the ideals of the abstract expressionists of the 1950s. They wanted not to be seductive, but to be high-minded. In the back of our thoughts today, this is still the model of art. Mere loveliness seems wrong as an aim for art. But in the philosophy of Venetian painting, being seductive goes with being high-minded, not against it. The abstract expressionists are 1950s people, not 1550s. They think painting is in a war with society. Painting is going to tell society off. Venetian painters think that society is great. For one thing, there's hardly anybody in it. Just a handful of humanists and dukes and courtiers. And some genius artists. By late middle age, Titian was known as both the richest artist had ever been, as well as the most artistically daring and inventive. When he travelled outside Venice, he was escorted as if he were royalty. He had lifetime pensions coming in from different governments all over the world. He had a contract with the King of Spain where he could paint more or less what he liked for the rest of his life and the King would buy it. He had a lot of different businesses going in Venice, including selling timber, which he ran with his son Orazio. So Titian really was calling the shots at every point. But in Titian's very late paintings, it's like the arc of his story is that having achieved the highest position, he goes on a journey into his own inner darkness. He's not a glossy hedonist anymore, but a restless disturber of luxury, a questioner of life's pleasures instead of a celebrator of them. His power and prestige are at an absolute height, but the flesh in his paintings now starts to seem decayed. His colours go from rich and brilliant to diseased. Here's a painting that Titian was working on at the time of his death. Nothing is known of his thoughts about it. The exciting thing about this painting is that there's two surfaces to be thinking about always. There's the surface of the painting, and then there's this surface of flesh. The painting seems to be all surface. This tawny, brackish, greyish stuff that has points of red coming through everywhere. So the painting is like a metaphor for the skinning alive that's going on with this guy. His skin is actually being stripped off the body by those sharp knives. The story is the flaying of Marcius from Ovid's Metamorphosis. Marcius, a satyr, those are his goat legs, that's how you can tell he's a satyr, loses a musical competition with the god Apollo. And the agreement is that whoever wins can do what he likes with the loser. So Apollo has Marcius skinned alive. Apollo stands for reason and the mind, and Marcius stands for the body and sensuality. So in the legend, it's like the triumph of the mind over the body. 
But Titian paints himself into the legend. It's him as this old king guy looking on at the horror here. Because the uh, physical substance of the painting dominates everything else, it's like that's the thing that Titian is questioning. He's asking himself at the end of his days, when he's nearly a hundred, or maybe even more than a hundred, since nobody knows how old Titian really was, what's the place of his type of painting in this eternal competition between the mind and the body? And the feeling is, because of the mood of the painting, that the questioning is a despairing kind of questioning. This is a Pietà by Titian. He's now in his 80s or 90s. While he was working on it, an outbreak of plague hit Venice. A Pietà is a scene where the Virgin Mary laments the dead Christ. Titian made a lot of changes to this painting as he went along. He complicated up the traditional symbolism with autobiography. Titian used his own features for the traditional figure of Nicodemus. The arch recalls the typical shape of a lot of the altarpieces of Bellini, Titian's teacher. The golden mosaic that Titian has painted at the top of the arch recalls the decorations of Venice, Titian's city. And the sculptures either side of the arch are like the art of Michelangelo, Titian's rival. There are huge, grand, tragic forms balanced by charming detail, like the one at the bottom of this statue, a little canvas that Titian has painted in. In this painting of a painting, you see the figures in the bottom right of Titian and his son Orazio praying to the figures in the top left of the Virgin Mary with the dead Christ in her lap. They're praying to be spared death from the plague. So you go from that little scene to the life-size real Titian to the real Christ, the real Virgin Mary, and the real Mary Magdalene, the reformed sinner now wildly grieving and out to this vast scene of memory, Titian's life as an artist, devotion, his belief in the afterlife and prayer. The, mes the message of this painting which is save us. With these last paintings where he gives himself important walk-on parts, Titian looks back on his life the wrangling and power-broking, the inspired, creative leaps and breakthroughs. But he sees it all in a mood of doubt. The beauty and light of his paintings versus his own fading light and his own old flesh. Titian started painting the Pietà in the mid-1570s. It was intended for the Frari, the church that commissioned the Assumption of the Virgin Mary from Titian when he was a young man. When Titian had first started painting the Assumption, 60 years before, in a special studio set up here at the Frari, it was considered a nightmare by the friars, who'd never seen anything like it before. They thought the figures were much too big and they kept bothering Titian to make them smaller. But then when he finished it, with its blazing light and its towering forms, it was considered an amazing success, and it marked the beginning of Titian's great rise in Venice. Now, in his old age, Titian decided he wanted to be buried here. He got involved with a complicated financial deal with the Frari. He would paint the Pietà for the friars, and as part of the deal, they promised to house his tomb. But then the plague arrived in the spring of 1576. It lasted for months. It turned out to be the worst outbreak of the century. It killed off half the city's population. Titian died of the plague on the 27th of August, 1576, and his body was buried here in the Frari a day later, in a very hurried ceremony because the plague was still raging in the streets of Venice. Titian's age was entered in the register here as 103. A couple of days later, his son Orazio also died of the plague. A mob immediately looted the house and studio on the Biri Grandi. A lot of Titian's stuff, including paintings, went missing. Not the Pietà, which was safely on show here, as Titian had asked. Only not for long, because it was returned to Titian's assistant, Palma Giovanni. It never came back to the Frari, either because the friars thought there was something wrong with the painting, or else they thought there was something wrong with the deal. 
mathematician invented modern painting. It's playfulness, independence and profound seriousness. Flesh he painted in furs, lying naked, glossy, muscular, old, wrinkled, young, lustrous, changes in modern art into colour, pattern, form and handling on their own. The recognisable stuff, the human imagery, all gradually drops out. That's the modern art ship drifting out to sea as far as most people are concerned. Then when imagery comes back again in our art, the kind of art that began in the 1960s, it's not connected to a painting tradition but to movies and TV and ads. It shows us ourselves, our shallowness, our lust to be amused all the time. Bring back painting, we hear, as if you could just reel it in again, exactly as it was in its old form. But it was like it was then because, and this really is the last word on Titian, the whole culture was set up that way. Ours is set up differently. We don't have a system of beliefs and skills in place to be able to turn out this kind of painting anymore. I don't think it's horrifying to admit that. We're not connected enough to it to be able to do it ourselves, but we are connected enough to it to be moved by it. Tonight's artist is Titian. That's a painting by him there. Titian is a late Renaissance painter. The Renaissance is already set up by his time. The centres are Florence and Rome. The style is tight, clear and flat. But in the early part of the 16th century, in Venice, where Titian lives, a new style starts up, kind of freeing up the Renaissance. The style of Venetian painting, which is loose and free, and has Titian as its main figure. So art historically, Titian is the guy who most of the artists whose paintings are in this room, Rubens, Velázquez, Rembrandt among them, are all looking out over their shoulder while they're working in their studios. They see the rich, melting touch of Venetian painting. It's suave effect. Perseus rescues Andromeda from a sea monster. Because we're only human, we're interested in her flesh. And that's the stuff that Titian can really get across. But the non-flesh imagery is connected to the flesh imagery. It's all united in that broken, patchy, greeny-brown texture that makes up the whole image. Andromeda's parents have to sacrifice her to save the Tempest from about 1510. There is no story, only a mood. The people are neither biblical nor mythological. They're not anybody. They don't stand for anything. You think she's the Virgin Mary, but actually the Virgin Mary would never be nude. In Giorgione's paintings, as with Titian's, x-rays show there's a lot of changes. This soldier, for example, started out as a nude woman. Previously, in Renaissance art, you worked everything out in advance before you started painting. In this new type of art, ideas and themes change all the time the painting has been put together. The scene gradually shuffles into place on the canvas. This is the earliest known painting that is definitely by Titian and that has survived in a good state. It's from 1510, the same time as Giorgione's The Tempest. It's the Holy Family and a Shepherd in London's National Gallery. By now, Titian is advancing his oil painting technique as he's seen Giorgione doing it. It's based on improvising. He moves paint around until he comes up with shapes that feel right. So this white stuff of the Virgin Mary's clothes and Jesus' clothes appears to find something like a perfect balance in the white clothes of that shepherd over there. It's not something that Titian could have calculated. And in fact, it's a complete fiction anyway because a shepherd would never have white clothes, he's a farm labourer. So it's something that the painting needs and that Titian has found in the paint. The painting is full of anatomical wrongness, the head of that guy's city where they live. But the painting hardly bothers with all that. Its real meaning is something else. 
Its impact comes from the touch of the brush and the play of the colour. If it were painted in a different way, it wouldn't have that feeling. So it's not the mythological subject that makes it what it is. It's the hazy, swirly, mergy colour that comes from Titian's painterly treatment. That treatment doesn't come from nowhere. The mottled, dusky surface, the sheen on the flesh and on the clothes, the constant feel of things changing and reforming. The city of Venice itself is a kind of nurturing ground for all that. The defining features of Venetian painting are a bit like those of Venice itself, especially different types of light. Reflected light in the lagoons and canals, which is strong and bright, contrasted with soft, dispersed light. What you're seeing in the architecture and the stuff that surrounds it, the water and the sky, is the boundaries between the man-made and the organic always blurring, nature always changing, and the man-made being deliberately designed to respond to those changes. And the stuff of this exchange between all those elements is light and colour. With its streaming, flowing facades, breaking up of bright surfaces with patterned openings, reflections everywhere, Venice was all about glittering, shimmering decoration. When Titian arrived here as a teenager, this rich look of the city that still survives today was even more exaggerated. Where we see charmingly distressed stone, a lot of the canal-faced buildings would have been covered with brightly coloured pictures done directly on the wall. Tiziano Vercellio, known to English-speaking audiences as Titian, was born in the town of Cadore, a little bit outside of Venice, sometime between the mid or late 1480s and 1490. No one knows exactly when, but we do know that by the early 1500s, when he was a teenager, he was in Venice working as the pupil and assistant of Giovanni Bellini, a much older artist, and that by 1507, he was part of the Venice art world. He'd left Bellini's studio and was knocking about with the painter Giorgione, who was about 10 years older than Titian. Titian had absorbed Bellini's style and was now copying Giorgione's style and sometimes collaborating with him on paintings. Oil painting wasn't invented in Venice, but Venice was where the medium was pushed the most. Giorgione and Titian were in the first generation of artists to train using oil. They both did frescoes at first, water-based paintings done directly into plaster on the wall, but they soon abandoned that for oil on canvas. That building that you can just see looming up now on the other side of the Rialto Bridge is where some frescoes used to be by Titian and Giorgione, the Fondaco dei Tedeschi. Now it's a post office, but in the 16th century, it was the headquarters of a load of German merchants. Giorgione's frescoes were visible on the canal side, this side, all along the building there, and Titian's were visible on the other side, the street side. Now all the frescoes are long gone, destroyed by the weather. The style of Titian's frescoes was a mixture of Giorgione and Bellini, his first teachers. This is Bellini, soft, gentle. The painting is the tenderest subject you can imagine, the Madonna and child. And yet, there's no false sentimentalism or sugariness whatsoever. The Madonna is a collection of blue triangles. The sky is a variation on that blue child connects with the colour of the background landscape. That landscape has a dreaminess that's like a separate mood on its own, and that mood is what Bellini's pupil, Giorgione, goes in for. This is Giorgione's style. This is his painting, The 